Wow, that was incredible, incredible start for our worship this morning and leading perfectly into the message. We are in a series of messages called, What Would Jesus Undo? Most of us are familiar with the wristbands that were out for years on WWJD. What would Jesus do? We're talking about what would Jesus undo. And before I begin to talk about that, I just want to say Thank you to all of the ones who agreed to be a host home or you agreed to be a small group leader for our study. We have groups that are meeting in the homes, and every single one of the groups that we have started are full right now. Some of them are getting ready to maybe even split. And so I just want to give a big thank you to all of our host homes and our small group leaders. You guys are incredible. It gives us such a wonderful opportunity to bring people together in circles and not in rows, because I believe we learn better when we do those kind of things together. And we are going somewhere today with our service, and that place that we are going is into, as Pastor Danny would say to us so oftentimes, we want to go into the heart of God. Now, when I was a Teenager, I did not always eat the best, and sometimes I still don't. But I can remember there was a time when I was in middle school and in high school, and almost every day for lunch, I ate jelly donuts or Krispy Kreme fruit pies. They were in our uh, cafeteria, and so I would go in there every morning, and I would buy those. And, and I just want to tell you, Elvis is not the only guy who loves a jelly donut. You know, a, a je- and one of these are gone. And, and, um, and I know Desi did not eat it. She does not let these things pass her lips. I would have to say before service started, I was feeling just a little hungry and uh, decided I would get one of these. You know, the thing that disappointed me the most, oftentimes when I would be going through the line, I'd pick up one of those fruit pies or I'd pick up one of those jelly donuts. I'd get back to my table and I'm sitting there and I bite into it and there was no jelly. There, there's nothing more disappointing than to be expecting, expecting this nice fruit center and you bite into it and it's empty. It's just air or to take a fruit pie, and you're going, it weighs a little different than normal, and you bite into it only to discover that the fruit filling only goes about halfway through the pie, and the rest of it is crust. I love a great jelly donut, and I love a great fruit pie. Nothing is more disappointing to me than to get one of those and it be empty. Have you ever wondered... If sometimes on a Sunday morning, a lot of what we offer up to God as worship often comes across to him like an empty jelly donut or like a fruit pie that's lacking the filling. All of the songs we sing, all of the prayers we pray, all of the motions we go through, come across to God as about as filling as one of those empty donuts or one of those half-baked fruit pies. And the reason why is we can go through all of the motions of worship and yet our hearts not be in it. And I think, honestly, if there was one thing that God would undo, if there's one thing that God would undo when it comes to his people, he would undo hollow worship. And hollow worship is where we go through all the outward motions and we put on an exterior of praise, but yet beneath the veneer of our lives, our hearts aren't in it. And that kind of worship is one of the things that I think God would address in your life and in my life. Because, folks, if we're honest, there's a lot of times we walk through the doors of the church and our hearts are not prepared to worship. Our minds are somewhere else. We may be physically present in the building, 
but yet we're not spiritually present. We may worship with our tithes and our offerings, but we're thinking about what it is we could have bought with that money we just put in the plate or what it's costing us in the long run. So I think one of the things that God would address in me and he would address in you is hollow worship. Why? Because it not only comes to God as meaningless and as empty, but I think it repulses him as well. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, as we dig into this topic, let me just tell you, this morning's service is going to be a little different from what you typically would expect here at McConnell. As a matter of fact, I said we're going somewhere today because I want you to understand that everything from this point forward that we're trying to do in the worship service is to prepare you to move into the heart of God as a worshiper, not just as a spectator, not just as a participant who's parked it on the pew today. We want you to engage with God today. We want you to be a worshiper, not just a worship attender. Everywhere that Jesus went, he drew crowds, and he didn't just draw crowds of people who loved him and liked him. He oftentimes had a group of people who followed him around from place to place in order that they might hear what he had to say in the hopes of catching him saying something that was against their law or against the traditions of their elders. And nowhere was this more emphatically pursued than when it came to worship. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that we need to remember, that if you were a devout Jew, you were very concerned about cleanliness. And I'm not talking about just taking a bath or a shower. For some of us, you know, we're obsessed with physical cleanliness. We've got our bottles of hand sanitizer everywhere we go, and we shake hands with somebody, we pump, pump, and You know, uh, you know, uh, I I hope we don't have any of those on our greeters. You know, hey, glad you're here this morning. (laughs) You know, pump, 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 you know, uh, take a bath with it, you know, just in case we might get contaminated. Well, there was a certain sect of the Jewish community called the Pharisees who were obsessed not about physical cleanliness, but about ceremonial cleanliness. And their obsession was that they believed that there was only two classes of people in the world, and they were clean and unclean. And so they wanted to make sure that they took everything that the law had to say, and they applied it to every aspect of their daily life. And they believed that if you touched something that was unclean, maybe it was a dead animal or a dead person, then that unclean thing would make you unclean. And then if you went home and you touched your children or your wife or your house, then that, that uncleanliness followed you and contaminated everything that you touched. And so not only were you unclean, but now your wife, your house, your children, your cat, your dog, your plates, everything that you came in contact with became unclean. And so they would go through these elaborate rituals elaborate rituals in order to make sure that they were ceremoniously clean in order that they might worship God. You see, their emphasis was not just on physical cleanliness, but it carried over into the aspect of worship because if you were ceremoniously unclean, you could not enter into worship of a holy God. And so they wanted to go through and make sure that everything in their lives was clean. It was pure. It was uncontaminated and undefiled. And so they came to Jesus and his disciples because they observed that Jesus and his disciples weren't following the law. And I'm not talking about the Mosaic law. They weren't following the traditions of their elders. They weren't following the customs that they had fenced around the law. Here was God's law, and then they built a fence around it in order to protect the law. And so they kept adding 
layers and layers and layers. This is, these are things you've got to do in order to protect the heart of the law, in order that we are clean and we can come into God's presence as a worshiper. So if you were getting ready to eat and you were a devout Jew and you were observant of the law, you would ceremoniously cleanse yourself. And it would take a quarter of a log of water in order to ceremoniously cleanse you from being unpure and unable to worship. And you're going, what is a quarter of a log? I've never seen that on my measuring cup, have you? A quarter of a log is one and a half egg shells. That's the amount of water that a quarter of a log was. And so what they would do is they would get someone who had a quarter of a log of water and they would put their hands together and they would have that person pour the water over their hands in order that that clean water would wash away all that had been contaminated and they would make sure that it, they kept their elbows out so that it would drip off because anything that the unclean water touched would then become in itself unclean. So they would do this and then they would do it again with the hands down. Okay, so that everything was dripping off straight down wouldn't contaminate anything else. So if you were a devout Jew, they didn't just do this before they came to table to eat. They would do it between every course. You would do it between your steak, and then you would do it again between your baked potato, and you would do it again between your salad. You would wash in order that you would be clean and that nothing would be contaminated. So they come to Jesus and they speak to him and this is what they said. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and it's interesting how they followed him all the way from Jerusalem. Not because they liked him but because they were out to get him. And ask, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. All of this ceremonial cleansing had to do with outward appearances, appearing righteous while at the same time, maybe on the inside, their hearts weren't where they really needed to be. And so Jesus unloads on them. Listen to what Jesus says. In Matthew 15, verse 7 and 8, he says this. He said, you hypocrites. And it was interesting. I, I, I went through several studies, and I, I wanted to find a definition that really made me understand why he was calling them this. A hypocrite is not just one who appears one way on the outside, but yet is different on the inside. But one Biblical commentator said this, a hypocrite is one who passes judgment from under a cover. A hypocrite is someone who passes judgment on the worship of others while yet hiding the true condition of their heart on the inside. So Jesus looks at them. He says, listen, you're hypocrites. Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. What would Jesus undo? I think Jesus would undo hollow worship. I think Jesus would underdo, undo the, the comfortable place that many of us are in walking into the house of worship, all dressed up, looking good on the outside, but yet our inward condition is about as far away from God as possible. I think Jesus would undo hollow worship. See, the problem with what the Pharisees were doing is not that different than what we do. 
It's going through all the motions, saying all the right things, praying all the right prayers, giving all the right things, serving in all the right places, but yet we do it from a position of appearance, not out of love for God. We do it because we want to be seen or we want to be thought of well by the people around us, and yet at the very same time, we're We have little concern about what God thinks of our hollow worship. You know, when we talk about worship, most of the time we confuse it. We confuse worship with style and substance. Because when we talk about worship in the church today, you know where most people automatically go? They they start going to the music. They want to talk about the music style as if God is only in favor of one music style and he prefers it above all others. If somehow we sing the wrong music, then we are not offering God acceptable worship. And many of you sitting here today probably did not grow up in a church like McConnell. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. And I can remember, you know, uh, uh, there was a time when I was confused about what worship really looked like. Because I grew up back and forth between two different denominations whose worship style was pretty different at that point in time. And one of those denominations was a Baptist denomination, and the churches that we attended were very conservative. It was almost to the point of being liturgical. If you're out of a Methodist or an Episcopalian background, you know what I'm talking about. We read the prayers. We're up, we're down. We follow the directions of the minister. Everybody stand, everybody sit. We say the Apostles' Creed. We sing this hymn, sing, everybody sing verses one, two, and four. Anybody grow up in a church like that? I was always wondering, what's wrong with verse three? We never sing it. You know, so we always skip verse three, so I I would always be looking in the hymnal, what does verse three say? And the worship was predictable. And it doesn't mean that people weren't connecting with God through that. It was just, that's what we did. And then we started going to a different church that was a whole lot more charismatic and enthusiastic in their worship. And so I can remember trying to make that adjustment. Everybody was raising their hands, and I was going, why are they doing that? Does someone have a question? Somebody answer that person's question. (laughs) What are they doing? And not only were they raising their hands, but I heard people speaking out loud, which was something my mom would pinch the fire out of me if I was speaking loud in church. And I noticed that people would just stand up in the middle of part of the message or part of the music, and I was looking around. But I found that the longer I went there, the more I got used to that style of worship. And I discovered that, honestly, Their style of worship was just as predictable as the worship style I came out of. And so it really made me begin to stop and think as a pastor, and as we look at the body of Christ all around the world, in different countries and in different cultures, there are people who worship very differently than we do. Some of them very enthusiastic, some of them very quiet and formal and reverent. And so I had to ask the question, which style of worship is right. Have you ever wrestled with that question? Which one is right? I've come to the conclusion either both of them are right, those that are very traditional and formal, very reverent and liturgical, those that are charismatic, those that are enthusiastic in their worship, they are either both right or neither of them are right. You see, because worship is not about style. Let's back up one slide. Worship is not about the style of music. It is about the condition of your heart. 
when you walk into this place. How many of you grew up with a different style of worship? I'm looking around. I remember when our kids were small, we went to visit my great uncle Bobby. And I love him to death. He was a retired sergeant major from the army, uh, was way up. And, and we loved him to death, but Bobby uh, didn't go to church a lot. And whenever we had an opportunity to visit him, we would always make sure if we happened to be there on the weekend that we went to church. And he decided, uh, I said, uh, Uncle Bobby, where are you going to church? And he says, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not, honestly, but there is a church really close to us that uh, you can come, and, and, and I, I would like to go. I've been wanting to check it out, and so we said, okay, we'll go there on Sunday morning. I can remember passing it on the way into his neighborhood, and I was going, hmm, from all outward appearances, you couldn't tell what kind of church this was, but there was a key word in their title. This was a tabernacle. Now, if you are a tabernacle church, you can be over here way on the right, or you can be over here way on the left. You don't know till you walk through the doors. And I can remember us getting up and going to church that Sunday, and we're sitting down. As we walk in, I see a drum set and all kinds of instruments on the, on the stage, and, and there's plexiglass all around the drum. So I said, oh, it's going to be loud today. <laughs> you know, if the church you walk into has baskets with earplugs in them, <laughs> You know how the worship is going to be. So we go in, and we're sitting down, and then the band begins to crank it up, and I can see my Uncle Bobby and even my kids. Their eyes are about this big, and they're just looking, looking. And so as the worship began to really get cranking, there was I heard something. It sounded like a, a train going off in the distance. Whoa! I looked back, and there's a guy running across the back aisle, just whoa, top of his lungs. Then he made a hard left turn, whoop, and he was heading to the stage, whoa, made a hard right turn as he got to the front of the stage, whoa, and, and I'm looking at my uncle, and he's going, <laughs> he's watching this. Maybe you grew up in a church where something like that wasn't very common. Or maybe it would never happen. If, if that happened in some of the churches I grew up on, I could see somebody on a walkie-talkie. Ushers, we have a runner on aisle four. Runner, aisle four. When he makes the turn, tackle him. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Or one of my deacons would have just went. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Face first. So here's the question. We got to go back. Which style of worship is right? Worship is not about the style of music we play. It's not about whether the choir wears robes or you can come to church in your shorts and your sandals. Worship has nothing to do with whether you're wearing a tie or whether you're wearing blue jeans. Worship has everything to do with the condition of your heart when you walk through the doors of this place. Are you going somewhere with your worship today? Did you just come to church today? Or are you going somewhere with your worship? Are you taking what you brought here today to God? Or are you just here for the show? So which form of worship is why? Let, let's take a look at a few passages of Scripture this morning because worship isn't about the style of music. It is about the condition of your heart. Worship is not just the songs we sing. It's the life we live. Worship doesn't just happen at 10, 15 on a Sunday morning or 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Worship happens every day, every hour. I'm going to take this off. And I'm going to have one of these. <laughs> Just kidding. Let's, let's talk about 
worship. How do we express our worship? Sometimes we bow in reverence to God. Sometimes we bow in worship. Sometimes we walk into the presence of the Holy God and we are overwhelmed with the Spirit of God that is in this place and in this moment. And our only response to Him is that we kneel in worship. We bow in worship. Listen to what the psalmist says, Psalms 95 verse 6. It says, come let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before Lord our God. You see, in light of who God is, and in light of what Jesus Christ has done, in light of Jesus going to the cross and shedding his blood for you and giving his life for you so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you have an opportunity to be reconciled with the Holy God. Sometimes the only response that we can give is that we bow down and worship him. Sometimes the scriptures tell us we lift our hands in adoration. I was at a ball game yesterday with some guys, and there were very few times that our side got to lift our hands. Most of the time, we were bowed down because our team was losing. But we oftentimes raise our hands, what? In celebration when our team scores a touchdown or when something great happens, we say, "Woo, awesome. And there are times where we come into this presence of the Holy God and we just want to celebrate. We just want to thank Him. And so we lift our hands and we sing and we praise Him. And sometimes we just want to say, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you accept me. Thank you that you forgive me. Jesus, I love you this morning. Sometimes that's what we do. Listen to what David said while he was in the wilderness. He said this. He said, I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Now, there's another biblical form of worship that we as Baptists really struggle with. And if you read through the Psalms and you read through the Old Testament, it says, sometimes we dance. And you're going, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. Baptists don't dance and Methodists don't rock and roll. Nope, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. But if we read through the Scripture... And if you think about your own life, I would imagine there's a lot of times where you have done the happy dance. You know, you're just like, something good has happened. He popped the question, or you got the new phone, or you got the raise, and you just, oh, you're doing the happy dance. And David said, there are times when I am so overwhelmed with the presence of God, I just had to dance. Listen to what the scripture says. It says, let them praise his name with dancing. Psalms 40, 149, verse 3. There's another biblical form of worship. And I think this is one that we more can relate to than maybe dancing. If dancing trips you up, here's one that I know you're going to understand, but you can't always Perform in the right way. It says we worship with a sacrifice of praise. What is a sacrifice of praise? A sacrifice of praise is when we come into God's presence and we give Him something of ourselves. Maybe it's in response to how life is going and you're just like, God, you are so good. I, I want to thank you. But sometimes we bring into the presence of the Holy God a sacrifice of praise when life is not going well. 
And like Job, we would say, even when he slays me, even when the report isn't good, even when things aren't going well, even when my health is struggling, I will still make a decision, a choice to praise him by bringing a sacrifice of worship to him. Why? Because, you see, our worship should be costing us something. It should be bringing of something of ourselves into his presence so that we're saying, God, because of who you are and what you do, I will praise you. I'll praise you when life is going good. I'll praise you even if life is going hard. I'm going to bring to you what you are looking and longing for, and that is worship that flows from my heart. Listen to what Paul said. In Hebrews, we're not really sure if Paul wrote Hebrews for sure or not, but it sounds a lot like him. He says, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And this brings me to the one that I think is most applicable. And it's the one that we struggle with the most. It's daily. It's not just on Sundays. It's not just when your small group meets. It's not just on Wednesday. But it's daily we are to lay down our lives as an act of worship. Everything. Everything. We're going somewhere. Not just when we leave this place today are we going home, but we're going home to worship God. We're going home to worship Him when we go to school on Monday. We're going home to worship God so that we can worship Him day in and day out. Listen to what the Bible says. It says in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act, your true form of worship. So worship is not about the songs we sing. It's about the life we live. It's about the life we live 24-7, 365 days a year, not just 52 Sundays, but 365 days a year, we're to be worshipers. Worshipers. We're going somewhere this morning. I want Chris and I want the band to come, and we're going to worship You see, I want to land this message today in the place that we have been going from the start, from the time you woke up this morning to the time you were deciding, what am I going to wear to church, to the time you walked through the doors into the sanctuary today. We were going somewhere. We were going into the presence of a holy and an awesome God. And my question is, were you ready to meet him there? Were you ready to meet him in the presence of worship? What did you bring with you today? What did you bring with you that's holy and acceptable and pleasing to him? You see, because I believe it's possible to go through all of the motions of worship and still miss the mark. If your heart is not in the right place. You see, worship is about those who've encountered the living God, and they understand who He is and what He's done for them. And as a response, they worship Him with all that they are, with all that they do, because He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your praise today. He loves you. He invites you to come into his presence. Right now, Father, would you prepare the hearts and the minds of your people to encounter you, to bring to you the worship that is not hollow and empty, 
that engages not just the head, but the heart as well. And for the ones that are here today and they don't understand, they don't have a clue, maybe they come to church week in and week out and they go through all the motions, but they miss the relationship with you. Today, Father, may heaven open. May their hearts open. May they change today and go from the dead to the living, from the lost to the found, and give you glory. Would you worship with us?